Since man first began to sail the seven seas thousands of years ago, reports of terrifying monsters of the deep have been preserved in ancient records, scrolls, and dusty volumes, written by seafarers, adventurers, and historians throughout history. One of the very first recorded sea serpent observations was made by King Sargon II of Assyria on a Mediterranean voyage to Cyprus around 720 BC. This encounter was memorialized in this image, depicting Phoenician longboats loading up lumber. Notice the sea serpent with its neck upright in the background. Here we also see a sea turtle and various fish depicted with the serpent. This is an urn found in Caria in Asia Minor, which is now modern-day Turkey, and dated at around 530 BC. It depicts what appears to be a ferocious sea monster battling the Greek hero Hercules. Depicted with the monster are several well-known sea creatures, such as a seal, an octopus, and two dolphins. But is it mere coincidence that this monster closely resembles a marine dinosaur called the Mosasaurus, that allegedly became extinct along with the dinosaurs millions of years ago? But when we compare this fossil Mosasaur skeleton with the monster on the urn, the similarity is quite remarkable. Other ancient cultures were also familiar with sea monsters. This Egyptian seal is dated from around 1400 BC, during the reign of Pharaoh Tutmosis III. The flippers, the rotund body, the long neck and small head are all reminiscent of a marine reptile known as a plesiosaur. The ancient Egyptians are known for their keen observation and accurate zoological representations particularly with regard to sea creatures. Could they have also have been familiar with living plesiosaurs? In his epic work, Naturalis Historia, the Roman historian Pliny the Elder described a type of sea serpent, said to be about thirty feet long, that swam with its head raised above the waves. This animal was sometimes observed by the crews of ships that carried Roman soldiers across the Mediterranean Sea. And this second-century mosaic, discovered in the remains of a Roman temple in Gloucestershire, England, depicts two long-necked sea dragons with linked necks. <laughs> the epic poem Beowulf tells of a hero of the same name who became a slayer of dragons. The poem, written in the West Saxon dialect of Old English, was penned between 975 to 1025 AD and was set in 6th century Scandinavia. Beowulf, a hero of his tribe, the Geats, comes to the aid of Hrothgar, king of the Danes, whose great hall had been repeatedly under attack by a monster known as Grendel. After Beowulf slays that hideous monster, he then tracks down Grendel's mother and also defeats her. Victorious, Beowulf goes home to Geatland, now Gotaland in modern Sweden, and later became king of his tribe. But before his triumph over Grendel and his mother, Beowulf proved his worth by harpooning and killing sea monsters that regularly attacked ships that sailed between Denmark and Sweden. 
Modern historians believe that the Vikings placed these fearful dragon heads on their ships to frighten their intended victims during their coastal raids around Europe. However, were these dragon heads really meant to deter sea monsters from attacking their ships? Perhaps to confirm this theory, this dragon's head from a Viking longship was carved with a deer's head in its mouth. And this 11th century Viking woodcut shows a man being swallowed by a dragon can still be seen today in Holar Cathedral in Iceland. But not all sea monsters around Denmark and Sweden were wiped out by Beowulf, as images of them adorn early maps of the oceans. One of the most famous of these maps is Olus Magnus's Carta Marina, drawn between 1527 and 1539. Magnus was a Catholic Archbishop of Sweden and a prominent historian. His map, the Carta Marina, one of the oldest ever created, depicts the Norwegian sea full of monsters. In 1555, Magnus published Historia di Gentibus Septentrionalibus, or a description of the northern peoples, which not only related the history, customs and beliefs of the Scandinavian people, but also described the sea monsters found on the Carta Marina. Off the coast of Greenland in 1734, missionary Hans Egede reported seeing a sea serpent so big its head reached as high as a ship's masthead. It spouted water like a whale, had skin like a reptile, and was as wide as the ship that Egede was sailing on. But it was four times the length. The illustration of this beast is said to be one of the earliest pictures based on a credible and reliable source. But sea monsters were not confined to the coastal waters of Europe. In 1802, 68 years after Hans Egede, the Reverend Abraham Cummings, a missionary to Maine in New England, used a small dinghy to sail from island to island as he propagated the gospel. During one such journey, Cummings and his family observed a sea monster only 50 yards from their boat. Up until that time, the good reverend dismissed stories of sea serpents that were common among his parishioners, that is, until he saw one for himself. Then in August 1817, in Gloucestershire, Massachusetts, a sea serpent with a long, dark body was observed from time to time by dozens of local residents. Witnesses on the shore said it resembled a long line of barrels riding high in the water. Those who saw it from ships reported a gigantic snake that was dark with a head like a horse. On the evening of August 6, 1848, the British warship Daedalus was sailing off the coast of Africa, south of St. Helena Island in the South Atlantic. The crew observed what they described as an enormous fish that was swimming past the boat with its head four feet out of the water. According to Captain Peter McQuay, it was dark with the mane of a horse or rather a bunch of seaweed washed about its back. The head was described as flat and snake-like. was made for British a drawing newspapers of the day showed a giant snake with a round head and no mane. But this became the image most widely associated with the sighting. Captain McQuay wrote in his journal, The creature passed rapidly but so close under our lee quarter that had it been a man of my acquaintance I should have easily recognized his features with the naked eye. Thirteen years later, on November 30th, 1861, the French corvette Alecton was sailing near Tenerife in the Spanish archipelago. As the ship neared the island, the lookout on duty 
yelled to the crew below, a large body partially submerged on the surface. The captain, Commander Beaujeu, had heard reports of giant squid, but the scientific community of the day disputed their existence. Seeing his chance to capture the rare species, the captain ordered the ship to attack and harpoon the squid. However, the weight was so great that when the crew tried to haul it aboard, the rope cut the body in two, leaving the crew with only the tail end. There are tales of giant squid that have attacked small fishing boats over the decades, which should not be so surprising, considering that squid have been observed off the coast of Japan at almost 60 feet in length. It has long been rumoured that even octopus could grow to colossal sizes, but the evidence was practically non-existent until November 30th, 1896. Two boys were playing along the beach in St. Augustine, Florida, when they came upon the huge blubbery mass of a dead sea creature that had washed ashore. The boys ran to Dr. D. Witt Webb, a local physician, who immediately went to the site and conducted a careful examination of the mass. Later, Professor Addison Emery Verrill of Yale University, who examined the remains, which alone reputedly weighed over six tons, calculated that the living creature had a girth of 25 feet and tentacles 72 feet in length. The evidence appears unmistakable that the St. Augustine Sea Monster was in fact a gigantic octopus, but the implications are fantastic. Even though monstrous sea serpents have been observed from time to time, the idea of a giant octopus with arms 75 to 100 feet in length and a total spread of some 200 feet is difficult to comprehend. A monster of this size would surely be a menace to any of the early wooden ships, as seen in this illustration by naturalist Pierre Denis de Montfort, which is based on the descriptions of French sailors who were reportedly attacked by just such a monster off the coast of Angola, West Africa. This image emphasizes just how terrifying such a monster would be if encountered by modern scuba divers. In 1905, while on the research vessel Valhalla, Michael J. Nickel and Edmund Mead Waldo were 15 miles east of the Paraíba River in Brazil on a research cruise when they both saw a large dark-colored rectangular fin moving through the water about a hundred yards away from them. The fin was about six feet long and about two feet high. Mead Waldo grabbed some binoculars to see the creature better and when he did, a long neck about the thickness of a man's body rose out of the water. The neck of the creature, he said, was from seven to eight feet in length, and the head and neck were the same thickness. He later stated that this creature was an example, I consider, of what has been so often reported for want of a better name as the Great Sea Serpent. World War I produced several memorable sea monster encounters. German U-boats were wreaking havoc on British ships across the Atlantic, and the captain of the U-boat, U-28, Commander for Herr George G. von Forstner, described an encounter in the following passage taken from his logbooks. The wreckage remained beneath the water for approximately 25 seconds, at a depth that remains clearly impossible to assess when suddenly there was a violent explosion, 
which shot pieces of debris. Among them, a giant aquatic animal, out of the water to a height of approximately 80 feet. At that moment, I had with me in the conning tower six of my officers of the watch, including the chief engineer, the navigator, and the helmsman. Simultaneously, we all drew one another's attention to this wonder of the seas, which was writhing and struggling amongst the debris. We were unable to identify the creature, but all of us agreed that it resembled an aquatic crocodile, which was about 60 feet long with four limbs resembling large webbed feet, a long pointed tail, and a head which also tapered to a point. Unfortunately, we were not able to take a photograph, for the animal sank out of sight after 10 or 15 seconds. Another German U-boat commander, Werner Loewisch, also recorded an observation of a huge crocodile-like sea monster. It was 10 o'clock on the evening of the 28th of July 1918, when he and another member of the crew spotted a gigantic sea monster in the North Atlantic. As they scanned the surrounding sea from the conning tower of the submarine, the U-09, Lowich described the monster as having a long head like a crocodile and legs with definite feet. It was at least 100 feet long, almost half the length of the U-boat, which was 214 feet in length. Is it possible that the crew of the U-28 and the U-09 observed a prehistoric terror of the seas, such as the Kronosaurus, that might have survived until recent times? The famed novelist Sir Arthur Conan Doyle maintained a keen interest in prehistoric animals and paranormal events. In 1928, Sir Arthur and his wife took a sea voyage to the island of Aegina in Greece. Standing on the deck of a steamer, they were gazing at the ancient temple of Poseidon, god of the sea, when they were distracted by something swimming parallel to the ship. Conan Doyle recalled that, the curious creature had a long neck and large flippers. I believe, as did my wife, that it was a young plesiosaurus. Plesiosaurs were marine reptiles that supposedly went extinct along with the dinosaurs. Yet eyewitnesses from around the world report seeing such incredible creatures even today. But sometimes a survivor from the age of the dinosaurs will make a surprise appearance, perplexing the scientific world. The coelacanth, which was once thought to be a transitional species that gave rise to lungfishes and tetrapods, was believed to have become extinct since the end of the Cretaceous period, allegedly 65 million years ago. But on December 23, 1938, museum curator Marjorie Courtney Latimer discovered a recently caught specimen among the catch of a local fisherman. Between 1938 and 1975, 84 specimens of the coelacanth, known popularly as the dinosaur fish, were caught and recorded. Later, a second coelacanth population was discovered off the north coast of Indonesia in 1999 by Mark V. Erdman. His wife, Arnaz, is seen here swimming alongside one such specimen. The frilled shark is even older than the coelacanth, known from the fossil record going back, according to the evolutionary timescale, over 80 million years. It has been caught as deep as 5,000 feet, and like the coelacanth, is often called a living fossil. And in this next story, we'll see this 1.6 meter eel-like animal identified as a deep sea frill shark. Let's take a look. 
When you think of a shark, you probably think of this, or maybe even this. The creature's fear factor doesn't depend on its color or its shape or even its size, or does it? If you thought this was scary, try taking a look at this. Yes, it is real and it's not something out of a horror movie, even though it could star in a Jaws meets Jurassic Park sequel. But it's no Hollywood camera that shot this video. This species of prehistoric shark was filmed this week by Marine Park staff in Japan. It's called a frilled shark and it's very rarely seen alive because its natural habitat is some 600 meters or more under the sea. But one lucky Japanese fisherman alerted marine officials over the weekend that he'd spotted what he said was an odd-looking eel-like creature with a mouthful of needle-sharp teeth. Well, this 1.6 meter long female might have deadly dentures, but she never lived long enough to test her bite. Truly a living fossil, she was in poor condition when park staff moved her to a seawater pool for observation and died just hours later. But if these prehistoric survivors from the deep are still with us today, could other, more formidable creatures still swim the seven seas? On Saturday, 24th of March, 1962, Edward McCleary and four young companions left their homes in Fort Walton Beach, Florida, for a diving expedition offshore from Pensacola. Their target was the USS Massachusetts, a decommissioned battleship deliberately sunk by naval gunfire in January 1921, and is still popular today with scuba divers who enjoy exploring the wreck. Joining McCleary on that fateful day was 17-year-old Warren Saley Jr., 16-year-old Eric Rule, 15-year-old Larry Bill, and 14-year-old Bradford Rice. The five companions paddled towards the Massachusetts aboard a rubber raft, but they ran afoul of unexpected currents, strong winds, and a fog that left them stranded on a buoy anchored to the sunken hulk of the battleship. At nightfall, according to McCleary, the boys detected a foul smell accompanied by a hissing sound, followed by a long-necked sea monster that approached the buoy. This prompted the terrified boys to swim in panic through the fog. McCleary saw the beast grab Eric Rule and drag him underwater, followed shortly by the sound of Saleh shouting, It's got Brad! Moments later, a scream signaled Saleh's fate while McCleary lost sight of Larry Bill in the mist. McCleary alone reached the shore, spending the night in a wartime gun emplacement near Fort McRae, where a helicopter crew from Pensacola's Naval Air Station found him on Sunday morning. Writing three years after the event, McCleary claimed that he immediately shared his monster tale with personnel at Pensacola's Naval Hospital, where he was treated for shock and exposure to the elements. On December 12, 1964, photographer Robert Lee Serek and his wife were boating in Stonehaven Bay near Hook Island in Australia when Lisa Reck's wife spotted a huge form in the water. Lisa Reck, his family, and Australian friend Hank De Jong had bought a motorboat and decided to spend three months on the island. The object proved to be a gigantic tadpole-like creature, estimated to be about 75 to 80 feet in length. This famous photograph of the huge animal with Lisa Reck in a small boat has been reprinted in countless newspapers, magazines and books all over the world and has yet to be proven to be a hoax.
on July 20, 1965, two United States Navy captains, Marvin McCamus and Bill Ramey, were operating the submersible, the Alvin, to inspect underwater communication cables. They descended to a depth of around 5,000 feet, near an area known as the Tongue of the Ocean, a deep oceanic trench in the Bahamas that separates the islands of Andros and New Providence. The trench has a flat bottom and is approximately 20 miles wide and 150 miles long at a depth of 6,600 feet. As the Alvin prepared to conduct his examination of underwater cables, both men observed a large sea creature swimming towards them. They later described the creature as possessing an extremely long neck that ended in a snake-like head with two large eyes staring in their direction. The body was quite thick and possessed four large flippers, two on each side, that propelled the creature smoothly through the water. The creature, which appeared startled by the presence of the Alvin and its powerful spotlights, swam up from the crevice in what appeared to be an attempt to distance itself from the mini-submarine. McCamus and Rainey watched as the large creature swam upwards and passed the front of the sub with its back facing them. Although Captain McCamus attempted to maneuver the Alvin into a position to photograph the retreating creature, it had swam out of range. The two men decided to return to the surface and were ridiculed when they explained what they saw. So why would these two highly experienced naval officers lie about what they had seen? Surely to concoct such a story would have been detrimental to their military careers. Bill Rainey passed away in 1985 and Marvin McCamus died in 2004 and was a highly respected, decorated naval officer and author of several scientific publications. These two men are regarded among the most reliable eyewitnesses to have observed a sea monster and insisted that the creature they saw in the Mariana Trench was indeed a living plesiosaur. The deepest diving mammal is the sperm whale which can hold its breath and dive thousands of feet down to feed on squid and fish. No one knows exactly how deep they can go, but submarine sonar readings have documented sperm whales at over one and a half miles below the surface. Some people argue that if plesiosaurs were still alive in our oceans, they would be seen more often as they would have to continually come up for air. However, sperm whales are rarely observed, despite their enormous size, because they spend 90% of their lives in the dark, cold waters of the deep, where they are almost never observed. Whales have lungs, breathe air just as all mammals do, they are warm-blooded, nurse their young with milk from mammary glands, and even have body hair. On the other hand, sea snakes are air-breathing reptiles and must come to the surface to breathe and spend from 30 minutes to 2 hours diving between breaths. They are among the most completely aquatic of all air-breathing vertebrates and even give birth to live young. They are among the most completely aquatic of all air-breathing vertebrates. Sea snakes would only have to bring their nostrils above the water to breathe. Imagine if this six-foot-long dead sea snake had been 30 feet long. Compared to this six-foot man, it would certainly be classified as a true sea serpent. In 1966, two British paratroopers, Captain John Ridgway and Sergeant Shea Blythe, successfully rowed across the Atlantic Ocean from Cape Cod to Ireland. They subsequently wrote an account of their trip in A Fighting Chance. In one page of the book, they described an extraordinary experience. Ridgway is rowing on a balmy night, and he wrote the following. Lulled by the unending monotony, I was shocked to full awakefulness by a swishing noise to starboard. I looked out over the water and saw the writhing, twisting shape of a great creature. 
It was outlined by the phosphorus in the sea, as if a string of neon lights were hanging from it. It was an enormous size, some thirty-five or more feet long, and it came towards me quite fast. I must have watched it for some ten seconds. It headed straight at me and disappeared right beneath me. I stopped rowing. I was frozen with terror at this apparition. I forced myself to turn my head to look over the port side. I saw nothing, but after a brief pause I heard a most tremendous splash. I am not an imaginative man, and I searched for a rational explanation. Shea and I had seen whales and sharks, dolphins and porpoises, flying fish, all sorts of sea creatures, but this monster in the night was none of these. I reluctantly had to believe that there was only one thing it could have been, a sea serpent. Could Captain Ridgway have seen the same type of frightful sea monster that attacked Edward McCleary and his friends three years before in Florida? In March 1969, a 35-ton carcass was found on the beach in Tesaluta, Mexico, and received a great deal of publicity. The strange carcass's serpent-like body was covered with hard, jointed armor. United Press International reported that biologists thought that the creature might have been a narwhal, which had a long tusk. But after seeing the carcass, they could not match it with any creature known to man. Therefore, the international press reported that a prehistoric monster of some sort had been beached and the whole world awaited further word on the carcass. A panel of seven scientists reported on April 20th, 1969, that the monster was probably a finback whale. As we can see by this comparison, the head of the monster does not belong to a finback whale. Tales of migrating sea monsters of Cornwall and Devon in southwest England are legion, and most sightings, at least those of the modern era, have been attributed to a monster known to the locals as Morgar, meaning sea giant in Cornish. This intriguing animal is purported to live in the sea near Falmouth Bay, Cornwall, on the south coast of England, one of which was made by two women on holiday from London. They described what they saw as an animal being between 30 to 40 feet in length and looking like a prehistoric monster. In February of that year, a lady known only as Mary F. sent two photographs, apparently of Morgar, to the Falmouth packet, along with a covering letter. She claimed that they were taken off Rose Mullion Head and described the creature as, It looked like an elephant waving its trunk but the trunk was a long neck with a small head at the end, like a snake's head. It had humps on his back, which moved in a funny way. The animal frightened me. I would not like to see it any closer. In April of 1977, a Japanese fishing vessel by the name of the Ziomaru was trawling off the coast of New Zealand when a large carcass became snarled in its nets. The rotting remains, weighing about 4,000 pounds, were hoisted up above the deck. Several photographs were taken and a fin was preserved before it was cast back into the sea in case it contaminated the ship's cargo of mackerel. This drawing by Michihiko Yanu, a crew member with some biology training, depicts a plesiosaur. A tissue sample that was taken from the carcass was studied by a team of Japanese scientists. Their 1978 study stated that, while the identity of the carcass could not be determined with certainty, Western scientists remained skeptical and insisted that the remains were nothing more than a decomposing basking shark. 
However, Tokio Shikama, paleontology professor at Yokohama National University, was convinced the remains were a plesiosaur. And Dr. Fujiro Yasuda from Tokyo University of Marine Science and Technology agreed, saying the photographs show the remains of a prehistoric animal. Later, the government of Japan released this commemorative postage stamp to celebrate the discovery. Sometimes the intact remains of a strange sea creature will wash ashore somewhere in the world. Such is the case of Gambo, so called because the creature washed ashore on the tropical beach of Gambia, West Africa, in 1983. The carcass was discovered by 15-year-old Owen Burnham and his family on the morning of June 12th. Owen, a wildlife enthusiast, decided to take measurements and then make sketches, since he did not have a camera with him at the time. According to later testimony, he did not think to take a sample of the flesh until after he realized he could not identify it in any books. According to Owen, the local villagers called it a dolphin, but that was likely only because of the superficial similarity. The carcass was later decapitated by local villagers and the head was sold to a tourist. Its body was then buried and attempts to relocate it since that time have failed. According to Owen, the carcass showed little or no signs of decomposition and measured around 15 feet in length. The coloration was brown on top and white below, and the skin itself was smooth. A small pair of nostrils were present at the tip of the beak. There has been a great deal of speculation as to what the carcass could have been in life. Although Gambo has been linked to a number of sea monster sightings around the world, could Gambo be a Geosaurus, a possible survivor from the days of the dinosaurs, like the coelacanth and the frilled shark? Gambo has also been connected to many sporadic reports of crocodile-like sea serpents in tropical waters around the world. Cadborosaurus, otherwise known as Caddy, is unique to the west coast of the United States and Canada, and is said by witnesses to resemble a serpent with vertical coils or humps behind the horse-like head and long neck, with a pair of small, elevating front flippers. Dr. Paul Le Blonde, Director of Earth and Ocean Scientists at the University of British Columbia, and the late Dr. Edward Boosfield, formerly chief zoologist of the Canadian Museum of Nature, made a careful and critical scientific study of caddy reports. Both men stated no known creature matches the characteristics found in over 300 sightings collected over the past 200 years along the coast of British Columbia, stretching from Cadborough Bay in British Columbia south to San Francisco Bay in California. This strange carcass was retrieved from the stomach of a sperm whale at Naden Harbour Whaling Station in British Columbia in 1937. The curious creature was just over 10 feet long, had a head like a horse or a camel, and a long bony body, and a series of flippers, including an odd-looking split tail. A portion of the backbone and skin was then shipped to the British Columbia Provincial Museum where the director of the museum had identified the remains as pieces of a baleen whale. The rest of the carcass was shipped to the American Whaling Company in Bellevue, Washington, where it was shown to the public. So what happened to the carcass? Surprise, surprise, it disappeared, after scientists insisted that it was nothing more than a fetal baleen whale. But if we compare the carcass on the left with a photo of a fetal baleen whale on the right, it is obvious that they are very different. There could have also been reports of adult and juvenile caddies being seen on remote stretches of beach along British Columbia. Could it be that this extraordinary creature comes on land to lay its eggs, much like sea turtles do today? Perhaps one day 
we'll have the answer. These two clips were taken in April 2016. The clips are believed to have been taken in the Docklands area of the River Thames in East London. Both clips, captured less than a mile apart in the span of one week, appear to show a large unidentified marine animal or animals swimming in the river. It's literally like... Have a look at this piece of film or something in the Thames, and of course, that's me spring into action, ready for something exciting and something. Here we go a hot trail of something, let's see what it is. Yeah. And there it was. And on first look, the video... Wow, that, that's impressive, what's that? Mm. If it was a still photograph, I'd instantly say 100% Photoshop. Right. And in August 2017, this footage was taken by a tourist from a boat cruising through the Arctic. It shows either a very long, single creature with prominent ridges along its back, or two animals of the same kind. Some have speculated that it was a line of seals, while others think it might have been two sturgeons swimming in a line. But the surface profile does not quite match a sturgeon. Perhaps, once again, an unknown species has been captured on film. Then, on October 7, 2019, this brief footage shows what appears to be a small but very odd-looking sea creature as it was passed by a fishing boat in Thailand. Was it an unknown species, a turtle without its shell, or even a hoax? Whatever it is, Nothing has been seen like it before. Over 71% of our planet is covered with water. The sea is vast and holds over 96.5% of all the Earth's water. The Mariana Trench, where Bill Ramey and Marvin McCamus spotted a living plesiosaur, is almost seven miles deep. We know more about the surface of Mars than we do about our own oceans, of which only 10% has been explored. And yet, over the centuries, strange carcasses have washed ashore all over the world. Most of these have been dismissed by scientists as decomposing basking sharks and dead whales. But many still defy conventional explanation. Occasionally, an oddity will be discovered such as this dead, two-headed dolphin pup washed up on a beach in Izmir on Turkey's west coast, or the increasing number of two-headed sharks being found in our oceans. Today, sea monsters are rarely reported. Perhaps the engine noise of the thousands of large ships crisscrossing our oceans has driven them away to more remote parts of the sea. Or could it be that eyewitnesses today are fearful of ridicule in this age of social media, should they share their own stories, photos, or even film of a sea monster? Whatever the reason, perhaps you might get lucky and capture high-quality digital footage of a legendary monster of the deep.